Hey, this is Barry O'Dell with the Church of Christ at Mammoth Spring Facebook page. Coming to you today to do a video on women's role. Now, I looked back at my, uh, I guess my archive of videos on our YouTube channel, and I back in November I did a video, actually two-part video on women's role. Um, but just well, yesterday I got a copy of the latest Christian Chronicle. And the Christian Chronicle is a newspaper put out by uh, by Churches of Christ. Uh, it's it's typically very liberal, written from a left leaning slant, I would say. And in this particular issue, the uh, the main topic of writing there's three or four different articles is on women's roles, and on the front page, uh, one of the articles is titled "Women's Roles." Uh, women's role is a divisive issue, but not a new one. And so that goes on in page one. Hey, Connie, um, I don't know what to tell you about that. You said frozen. Hopefully that won't last for too long. Let me know if everything clears up, if you would, please. Uh, okay, going now. Good afternoon. Good to see you. Thanks for being on here today. So that's that's one of the, one of the articles. That's on the front page article. Um, you have a, an internal page, uh, page 16, 17, uh, page 19, and then uh, page 21. So there are several pages, and then also page 23, several pages in this edition of the Christian Chronicle that deal with women's roles in the church. And of course, right now, that's a, that's a hot topic within Churches of Christ. There are, as I said in that video back in November, there are congregations that... Um, are uh, in the process of of um, changing their what they call the traditional view of women's role in the church, women's role in the public assembly of the congregation, um, more inclusive. I, I told you back in November about a website uh, that that will point you in the and not only in the United States, but I think it also includes Canada, to but it'll point you to congregations that that include women in leadership roles. Uh, the website is called wherethespiritleads.org, and you can check that out uh, if you want to. But uh, there were, I, I noticed some things um, in, in these particular articles that I read today uh, that I want to share with you that, that I think get down to the, to the nuts and bolts of why this, is, why this change is going on. I, I personally think, it's my personal opinion, that one of the reasons these changes are taking place is because of society. Um, I, in, in fact, I have no doubt about that in my mind, that one of the reasons this is such a major issue right now within the Churches of Christ is because of the political climate, um, not only in America, but around the world. Um, and, and we know the argumentation. Uh, I mean, we're, we're, in, we're living in a society where uh, men can become women, women can become men. Uh, you can choose to identify as non-gender. Um, so everything's up in the air right now. It's it's we live in a crazy world. There's no question about it. Anyway, I, I really do think that's one of the reasons this is a hot topic right now because that's kind of on the front burner. I I, I think really too right now in our own country we're in the we're in the heat of the political season. You've got debates going on. You've got an election coming up this year. So so this is all at the forefront of media coverage and things like this. Uh, good afternoon, Gene. Thanks for watching today. Hope you're having a good day. So I just want to get into this. So um, talking about women's roles. Uh, so there, there are two terms that are used in this discussion, and I had never seen one of these terms before, so I'm going to share it with you. Uh, this article is on page 16 in the Christian Chronicle, and it says, Defining the Terms of the Gender Role Debate. It says, When Discussing the Role of Women in the Church, Christians use terms including egalitarian, complementarian, and traditionalist. They often disagree on what these terms mean. Sources for this report offered these definitions. So you get into these words uh, and debates over language and things. Um, well, just listen to these definitions. An egalitarian, okay, if you have an egalitarian view, this belief views men and women as equally able to teach, preach, lead prayers, lead singing, serve the Lord's Supper, and perform other duties in mixed gender assemblies. Okay? That's egalitarian. The complementarian is the belief 
Uh, this belief views men and women as partners in ministry who play differing roles based on gender. Some also refer to this belief as traditionalist. So you have to define your terms in order to understand what's going on here. Um, I've, I've got a comment here, um, and it's a good comment. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to that comment, Connie, a little bit later in the video, but thanks for making that, uh, for putting in there what you said, because uh, you're absolutely right. So I, what, what I want to do is just kind of read some excerpts, because from all of these articles, these three or four different articles in this page, you obviously have people on both sides of the issue. Yes, you should. Uh, the, the, the church should be more gender inclusive in their public assemblies. Women should be able to lead singing. Women should be able to preach. Uh, they should be able to serve the Lord's Supper. And then you have the other side of the coin, which is no. Uh, that's, there are differing roles for males and females in the public assembly. But I also found as I was reading this, some people, are they haven't made up their mind either way. They're still working through it. And I think there's some language in these articles that show um, that there's a, and this has been my experience over the years. I, I've told you this before. I've been preaching for over 20 years in uh, th uh, three different states. I've had a lot of experience. And it's been my experience in all that time. When I hear somebody changing their views, when they start saying things like, well, Upon further study, I've decided, or something like, you know, I've dug a little bit deeper and I've changed my mind. Usually that's never a good thing. It, it usually indicates somebody's about to, uh, as First Timothy chapter 4 says, depart from the faith. Um, but, but anyway, uh, I, I want to get into some of these arguments. One of the main arguments that's used for a more gender-inclusive worship service, for women to be able to preach, uh, pass communion trays, pray, do everything a male can do uh, in worship is giftedness, okay? In other words, they have this gift. Now, I did a, I did a video, uh, was it yesterday? What did I do a video on yesterday? I don't know. But anyway, I think it was yesterday, may have been Tuesday, on spiritual gifts. I talked about spiritual gifts. That every time we see that language used in Scripture, it's talking about miraculous abilities. We, nobody has spiritual gifts today. Those things died at, either at some point during the first century, along with the apostles, or at the end of the first century, uh, perhaps with the last person who died upon whom an apostle had laid hands, because that's how the gift of the Holy Spirit was, was passed on. That's kind of another subject, but it, it, this subject is presented uh, with the concept of, well, if a woman is gifted in this area, then she should be able to use her gifts to glorify God you know, for the benefit of the whole church. So one of these comments in here, <clears throat> and this comment I'm going to read to you is from a man who believes that the church in, in the public assembly should be more gender inclusive. Um, in fact, he is the, it, it's said here, he's an elder in a church in Abilene where two women were among four new elders added in January. So you know their position, obviously. Here's his quote. There are no boy gifts or girl gifts in 1 Corinthians 12 or Galatians 5, he said. That's who we are in Christ. As much as I am Christ-like, I am doing a good job as a man or as a woman. So one of the major issues with his statement there is that he references 1 Corinthians chapter 12 in terms of giftedness. Um, 1 Corinthians 12 is talking about miraculous abilities. It's not talking about some natural talent that somebody has. Um, and, and I've talked about that before in that video I did just the other day. There are people, I, I am not a talented song leader. I can get up and I can get a song started. I can do that. But thankfully, we've got men here at Mammoth Spring who are talented, who can get up there and, and lead a song. And I'm thankful for that. When, when people go to 1 Corinthians 12 to make this argument for, for a more gender-inclusive uh, uh, worship service, uh, assembly of mixed gender, and they say, well, 1 Corinthians 12 doesn't identify boy gifts or girl gifts. They're, they're, they're ripping 1 Corinthians 12 completely out of context. Those are miraculous abilities. And if you want to know what those abilities are, read 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 through 11, and those gifts are, are they were dispensed at the will of the Godhead. That's verses 4 and 4 four, five, and six or so. And when you get to the end of that section in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 11, 
it says those gifts were dispersed as the Holy Spirit saw fit. It was done according to His will. We're not told, we are never told in Scripture to find our spiritual gift. We're never told to, to, to try different things in the worship service, whether you're male or female, to see where you are gifted. But that's the language that's employed by these people who are pushing for that egalitarian position. And again, that I know that's a fancy word, but that just means that women should be able to do everything the man does in the public assembly. Okay, If, if you're going to use a chapter to prove it, don't go to 1 Corinthians 12 because that's talking about miraculous. Now, he also mentioned Galatians 5, and, you know, I've read the Bible quite often, but I went back and I looked at Galatians 5. I don't know what he's talking about there in terms of gifts. Uh, we, have, we have the concept throughout that chapter of being led by the Spirit. Perhaps that's what he's talking about. We have the fruit of the Spirit, um, but this idea of being gifted is um, I, I couldn't find it in Galatians chapter 5. Maybe it was a, mis, um, a misstatement. That could be. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. But, but there's that idea. So what is, what is his solution? Again, this is an elder in a congregation where they've just recently, last month in fact, appointed two women as elders to serve in their church. So how did he come to a conclusion like this? And, and how does he help other congregations do this? Because that's what he does. That's one thing that he does is he communicates with other churches how he can uh, how they can kind of walk through this process of becoming more gender inclusive so here's what he says when elders ask what can I do to prepare for this again the more gender inclusive worship this man tells them to love their folks and I want you to notice how generalized and how vague this comment is here love their folks and here's his quote this is what he would tell an eldership who is um, maybe debating or looking at becoming more gender inclusive in worship. He says, do the people trust you? Have you been there at the weddings and the funerals? Do you bring them a meal? Uh, did you bring them a meal? Did you rejoice when they rejoiced and weep when they wept? When something is different, let's see, uh, when something is different, it's a trust issue and how well they have shepherded and loved on their flock will become evident. So, hey, Joe Henry, how are you today? Uh, so it, it, this becomes an emotional approach to Scripture, and, and that's a very dangerous thing to do. Is it, and, and I want to be careful how I say that, because everything that we do, I think, for God should be out of the right heart. It should be an emotional response, but there's, there's a difference in being emotional in your faith, uh, emotional in your, in your worship, versus emotionalism. This is emotionalism. So they're talking about changing the very fabric of a congregation, changing the fabric of an eldership, changing the way the church worships. Okay, If, they, if it was a traditional congregation and they, went, they want to become egalitarian, well, they need to know that you love them. And, and again, I, th now this just caught my eye as I was reading how he handles this. His first question to them was, do the people trust you? Um, that, that was big to me. Do the people trust you? Okay. Uh, I, you know, I wonder, I, I think of Acts chapter 20 when Paul talked to the elders at Ephesus. And he was he was giving them warnings about departures from the faith. You you think the members at, at Ephesus trusted those elders and loved those elders? Probably. But Paul said, I know when I leave, some of you will depart. <laughs> so I mean, and to me, that was when I read that, do the people trust you? Well, maybe they trust you too much. If if you're leading them away from scriptural precedent, they trust you way too much and they don't know God's word nearly enough. Um, okay, so what, a good comment here. Why is it that every time someone wants to do something that goes against God's teaching, they use love as the authority to do it? Because it's, a, I would say, because that's an appeal to emotion. You don't want to question anybody's love. You don't want to question anybody's sincerity. So it's all about love and trust and feelings. And that's a lot of times where this conversation goes when we're talking specifically about this issue. So moving on from that 
from that point, there's another article in here that starts on page 21, and it's called The Journey That Led a Church to Appoint Female Elders. Uh, and it talks about that. And, and one thing that I picked up throughout this article are these different words. Um, they have wrestled with this. They've struggled with this. They've grappled with this problem. They use this, um, they use this language that is, uh, it, it, puts in, it puts in my mind, I studied Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu uh, and martial arts for many years. I, I, I picture two people rolling around on a mat trying to tap somebody out. Um, and they, they, they use this language, I think, again, kind of in a, an emotional sense. I really struggled with this. I really wrestled with where I should go and, and what I should stand with. Um, so th this, this one congregation that, that is being discussed here uh, on page 21, uh, in 1998, the congregation added an inclusive service that allowed women to serve communion, lead, lead singing, pray, read scripture, and baptize people. A traditional service remained for those uncomfortable with the more progressive approach. So here's my question. Now you have a congregation because of their progress, okay, and I use that term loosely, progress. Because of their so-called progress, they're going to offer two different worship services because some people are uncomfortable with the direction that church has now decided to go. My first question would be, why did it take you until 1998? If this is the right thing to do, if this is what Scripture has revealed, I, I don't know how long this congregation's been around, but why did it take you until the end of the 20th century to, to, to get with it? I think that kind of is indicative, too, um, of the, the situation here. So it begins talking about progress that they made further. In July 2013, the leadership issued a statement that said, as a result of our on – okay, so here's that thing I said, this type of language is used. Listen to it. As a result of our ongoing study of Scripture – we discern God's call on this church to fully use the gifts. Okay, there's that word again, gift. People don't know what spiritual gifts are. It's, and that's, that's obvious when you, read this, uh, when you read these articles. People talking about giftedness and talents. Those are two different things, biblically speaking. There are at least four words in your New Testament that are translated as gift. You've got, the, you've got a couple of words, uh, doron and doria, um, that, that talk about... Um, giving a gift, you know, something that's given to someone else as a gift. But you also have this word throughout the New Testament, charisma or charismata, and that is used in reference to spiritual gifts, okay, miraculous abilities. So, but, but people conflate these two things. So this church is going to fully use the gifts of men and women to share God's word through preaching in order to build up the body of Christ here and for the good of God's kingdom. They, and, and here's what they say we've done. We've taken one verse, women be silent in church, and we elevate it because it reinforces our cultural bias. And that's one of the main arguments that, that these people make who want to progress into a more uh, gender-inclusive worship service. It's cultural. What Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, that was cultural. What Paul said in 1 Timothy 2 is cultural. I'm going to show you here in a little bit, it's anything but cultural. Um, anyway, so this goes on. Uh, this, this same congregation, again, talks about the continuation of their progress. Uh, about five years ago, uh, though the congregation appointed deacons and allowed women to be nominated. Okay, so some were nominated um, as deacons. I guess we would say deaconesses, but then some later were, were put forward as elders, to serve as elders in the church. Um. So one of the women that was put forward as an elder in this congregation, this is her reasoning. This is what she says. This time it took more praying and more study, and listen to this, and more outside counsel. If you're praying and studying God's Word, why do you need further outside counsel, and where are you getting that counsel from? Um, and, and So here's how she came to her conclusion that she should serve as an elder. But one morning... Let's see, but one morning, really, after a sleepless night, the Holy Spirit made it clear that in spite of my doubts and fears, I was to say yes. How did he do that? How, did, did he speak to you audibly? Uh, if he did, what did he say specifically? Um, 
I don't even have, I've already been on here for 20 minutes. I don't have time to go into all the mess that, that is in, within that one statement. The Holy Spirit speaks to us through his word. This is the, the Bible is the revelation that the Holy Spirit gives to us. We have it. We read it. We can understand it. Anybody who tells you that the Holy Spirit speaks to them is a false teacher. I mean, let's just lay that out there right now. That they're getting some, some message apart from Scripture that the Holy Spirit's giving them after a sleepless night, now I should become a female elder. That's a false teacher, period. You know, there's no room to, to disagree with that. But this, this lady goes on to say, we're a priesthood of believers and we can all serve in these different ways. The gospel is too great to just give it to a handful of men. It needs to be the whole body. It was a journey for me. And, and so journey, okay, wrestling, grappling, struggling. It was a journey for me, so I'm not going to negate other people's journeys. But page 23 starts another article, and again, it's the same, same, same deal. Uh, they talk a little bit about tradition, how this is some churches' traditions and not other churches' traditions. So let's, like I said, I've already been on here for 21 minutes now, and I'm not going to stay on here forever. Let's, let's just think, first of all, about um, female elders. Okay, So there are several passages that address elders in the New Testament. And again, I've gone over this in previous videos. You can go to our YouTube channel, Mammoth Spring Church of Christ. You can go back to November. It was late November. I don't remember the date. But I did two videos on this particular subject. Um, but when, when you think about the qualifications of elders, there are several passages that come to mind. Acts chapter 20, uh, verses 17 to about verse 32. Um, first, uh, let's see, 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7. Titus chapter 1, beginning in verse 5. 1 Peter chapter 5, there are several passages in your New Testament that speak of elders in the church. Um, so how do, the question then, and this isn't, I mean, this is basic stuff. This is very fundamental truth from Scripture. So when I'm reading 1 Timothy chapter 3, okay, just for instance, uh, verse 1 beginning, this is a faithful saying, if a man... Let me look at something here. I've got my Greek New Testament um, here with me. And I'm going to look at some things as I'm doing this. So if a man desires the position of a bishop, and that's what I was looking at to see. I, I'd never really considered this before. So I'm going to look at a couple different things here um, in, my, uh, in my notes. So let's see, 1 Timothy chapter 3. You know, you don't have to know Greek and Hebrew uh, to know what to do to be a Christian, to know what to do to get to heaven. But I tell you what, it's still, it, it could be very helpful. Okay. Okay, so the, the term that's used here, what, where the, the King James says a man, you have this, uh, this word that's defined as, uh, it, it's not really a part of speech. It, it's saying whoever. Okay, so whoever desires... Whoever is stretching himself out towards being an elder desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless. That's number one. What's number two? The husband of one wife. Discussion over. I don't have to go any further uh, in, with this question. Can a woman serve as an elder? Can a woman be the husband of one wife? Okay, so if that's not enough, all right, you go to... Um, Titus chapter 1 and verse 5. For this reason, Paul talking to, to Titus, for this reason I left you in Crete that you should set in order things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. If a man... Okay, so let me look that up real quick. Uh, let me see if it's that same term uh, that I just read in Timothy. Uh, verse 6. Okay, so the New King James says here, it's interesting... In verse 6, if a man be blameless, the King James says, if any be. And it's the same idea, if anybody, you know, whoever. Uh, so let's just read it that way. Whoever is blameless, number one. What's number two? The husband of one wife. That's it. Okay, so we're done with elders. A woman cannot serve as an elder in the church, period. Ever. It's not going to happen. I don't care what society says. All right. So what about deacons? Because that was part of that discussion can a can a um, 
Women serve as deacons, okay? So we go back to 1 Timothy 3 and verse 8. Likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience, but let these first be tested, then let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. And then you skip down to verse 12. Let deacons be the husbands of one wife. Okay, now I would say, okay, conversation over, because deacons be the husband of one wife. However, we have verse 11, okay, 1 Timothy 3 and verse 11. So you have these qualifications for a deacon in verses 8 through 10. Then verse 11 says, likewise their wives must be. Now the interesting thing about that is when you look at it in the original language in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 8, uh, or I'm sorry, verse 11, it, again, the New King James says, likewise their wives. The Greek says, um, gunaikos hosaltos. In other words, women likewise, or in the that that, um, that word there uh, translated likewise is an adverb. In other words, in the same way or in the same manner, women must behave this way. And he has a, a thing there, they reverent, not slanderous, temperate, faithful in all things. Okay, so he's talking about women. Uh, nothing is said that, it, so what some people do with 1 Timothy 3 and verse 11, well, he's talking about deacons, and, and so verse 11 must refer to female deacons. Okay, so 1 Timothy 3, 12. Let deacons be the husbands of one wife. Um, there, there's no word in the Greek but differing between woman and wife. It's, it, you know, contextually it will be translated sometimes as wife, sometimes as woman. Translators have chosen to make it in verse 11 because of the context. He's talking about deacons likewise wives. They need to behave themselves in such a way. The indication being that um, a man may not have his household in order, and that would disqualify him. Same thing's true with elders. Uh, we see that in 1 Timothy 3 and, and uh, uh, Titus chapter 1. 1 Timothy 3.11 is not a, a list of qualifications for deaconesses, for female deacons. And I know the arguments here. Well, Phoebe was a deacon, Romans 16. Uh, no, she wasn't. She was not a deaconess. And and people, it, it just when people make arguments like that, it shows the the lack of knowledge that they have of some very fundamental definitions. Uh, deacon in the Greek language, if if you were to see it in Greek, right next to the English word, it's this, essentially the same letters. It's not a translation. Deacon is not a translation of some Greek word. The Greek word is diakonos. The word means a minister, a servant, an attendant, something like that. Phoebe was a, a minister in the church. She was a servant. Every Christian is a minister, but not every Christian is a deacon. So I know the line of argument that these people use, and it's completely flawed. So he goes from saying, likewise women, or again, likewise wives, be this way, and then he gets right back to it. Let deacons be the husbands of one wife. So really, yeah, that conversation's over. A deacon, a, a woman cannot serve as a deacon. I don't care how much you've struggled with it. I, I don't care how much you've grappled with it. I don't care how long your journey was. This ends it right here. Your journey comes to an end right here. Okay, your wrestling match with Scripture stops right here. Um, and I know to a lot of people that's harsh and judgmental and misogynistic. We know all these current cultural terms when, when people talk plainly. Um, there's nothing misogynistic about this. What people are failing to understand, I think because of the influence of culture, because of the influence of politics, they're failing to understand the God-given differences between the male and the female. I really believe that. Right here in 1 Timothy 3, right next door to 1 Timothy 3 is 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verses 8 through 15. And uh, that, that, th those two videos I did back in November deal pretty uh, extensively with 1 Timothy 2, verses 8 through 15, and also 1 Corinthians chapter 14, uh, beginning in verse 34. But one thing that we learn there is that um, there is a God-designed difference between the male and the female. 1 Timothy 2, 8. I desire, therefore, that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. A couple of things. Number one, I desire, therefore, that the males... That's the gender-specific term in the Greek language, aner. The males, in every, uh, that the ma males pray, the King James and New King James says everywhere. 
And in reality, the, the 1901 American Standard Version hits it on the head here. It translates that phrase there, that the men pray in every place. Uh, the Greek word there is topos, like a topographic map, a very detailed map with, with lines showing elevation and locations and things like this. What Paul is saying here says, I desire therefore that the males pray in every place. And then he's going to contrast that with women. So you, you have there the discussion of when men, when males and females are together, the men are to pray in every place. He lays out for us here how a mixed gender assembly is to be conducted. The women are to conduct themselves in a proper way. Um, in fact, in verse 10, that which is proper for women professing godliness let a wo woman learn in silence with all subjection or with all submission. And that word silence there is, is interesting because it's not, don't make a sound. Um, in fact, back up in first Timothy chapter two and verse, uh, two, it says that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life. That's the same word translated down in verse 11 that a woman should learn in silence. It's talking about her proper place, her proper conduct, not that she can't make a sound. Um, that wouldn't make any sense whatsoever in any setting. Um, but th that's what 1 Timothy 2 is dealing with, and, and it's just very clear. There, there are God-given roles for males and for females, and this is not cultural. This wasn't limited to Ephesus. It wasn't limited to Corinth. And here's the reason I know that. When, when Paul's making this point here in 1 Timothy chapter 2, Okay, so why is it that males should pray in every place where there are males and females present? Listen to verse 13. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman, being deceived, fell. His argument has nothing to do with um, time limitations or, or uh, geographical limitations. To say that this only applied to Ephesus in the first century is absolutely ridiculous. If that were the case, why did he go all the way back to the Garden of Eden and say man was created first? Eve wasn't born in Ephesus, okay? She didn't live in Ephesus in the first century. The, 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 the structure that God has for a mixed gender assembly is that the males lead and the females conduct themselves peaceably in that assembly. They're not forbidden from singing. They're not forbidden from you know, if a preacher's preaching, saying amen, agreeing with what's being said, that's not, they're not told to, to shut up. They're told to conduct themselves with propriety in the, the, the mixed assembly. And 1 Corinthians 14 is a little bit different. I really, and this is just my personal opinion, and I, so, I know some people disagree with me on this. In my opinion, 1 Corinthians 14 is not really a good passage to use because it's, um, it's considering a miraculous context with prophesying, speaking in tongues, and things like this. The same principles there, I understand that, of the roles of men and women. But I will address 1 Corinthians 14 if someone wants me to. But really, it's, it's a, it, not really, it is a miraculous context. But the, the thing is, the same instructions are given. And the same precedent is given. When you go back to 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 34, let the women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive, as the law also says. Submissive, that is, in order, okay? And that's Paul's whole argument in 1 Corinthians 14, let all things be done decently and in order. But he says, as also the law says. That's, that's a reference to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 16, where from the beginning, God has had a role for the male and for the female. Whether you're talking about marriage, um, or, or the church today. God has a, a specified role. And again, I don't care how much you struggle, how much you wrestle, how much you grapple. I don't care your journey. If you're in violation of Scripture, you're in violation of Scripture, period. There's, there's no two ways about it. Um, so here's a comment uh, talking about the you know things being done in love. Somebody said this. It's a smokescreen. Using the term love as an argument is to put the other person on defense to prove they are not hating people and do love other souls changes the topic, and that's a yeah, that's an absolute, that's a great point that you make there. Um, okay, now here's this is an interesting point. Um, 
Even in a congregation that happened to be all women, they could not be appointed as elders or deacons. I, was, I actually found myself in that situation uh, for a couple of years. While I was going to Memphis School of Preaching, I preached out about eight miles outside of Osceola, Arkansas, and it was called the Little River Church of Christ. And uh, most of the time, every now and then, there would be this guy that would show up. Most of the time, it was eight women and me. Okay, so uh, I've been in that boat. Not always comfortable. But anyway, um, so, you know, this, this, this article in the Christian, or these series, series of articles, there's actually a pretty good one. Um, I don't know if you can get this online, but uh, ChristianChronicle.org. There's actually a pretty good article in here. On starts on page 19 called "Should Women Preach in a Mixed Gender Assembly?" Uh, that article actually does a pretty good job. But the rest of them, to me, are based on emotional responses and things like this, and that's never good. So anyway, I thought I'd come on here today, address this topic. Like I said, it, this is one of the hot top, hot button issues right now in the Lord's Church. And when you break down Scripture, when you look at it. There, there, there's no debate here. There, there's nothing hard to understand. You don't have to go through a journey. You don't have to wrestle with anything. Um, and I, I, kind of, I, I kind of find that ironic. As I'm wrapping it up here, I'll just share this thought with you. That, so they're wrestling with this issue. And most of the people in, in these articles that wrestle with it come to the conclusion that they should be egalitarian. And again, that means gender inclusive in the, the mixed gender assemblies. Women should be allowed to preach and lead sing. They wrestle with it. You, you remember what second Peter three sixteen says it talks about people resting the scriptures to their own destruction. The, the, the King James says resting W R E S T I N G. I, I believe the new King James says twisting the scriptures. So, you know, you can wrestle with scriptures all day long and you can twist them uh, and you're going to do that to your own destruction. I'm, I'm very afraid that that's what's happening in a lot of places. To be more inclusive in society, to fit in better with the current cultural movements, we're going to change what the word of God says. And again, just think how clear that is. Let the, let the bishops be the husband of one wife. Let the deacons be the husband of one wife. Okay, that's, that's it. Question, discussion over. I need to wrap this up. I've been going almost 40 minutes. Um, I got to get a haircut here in a little bit, but I appreciate. Okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll notice this one last comment here. Satan is pushing hard to divide the church. Absolutely. And here's the thing. People are pushovers. Again, they, they want to study further. They want to get some outside counsel. They want to have a journey and struggle and they want to have an emotional experience and they're pushovers. They don't know the Bible. Um, and if they do know what the Bible says, they'll say something like, well, that was just cultural. Um, it's sad to see. So anyway, I appreciate all the comments on here today. I think this might be the most comments I've gotten during a live stream. Uh, as usual, I'm going to upload this video to our YouTube channel. So if you have somebody who doesn't do Facebook, they can go to YouTube and, and uh, watch this. And as always, thanks for watching. Share these videos, like them. And if you have any questions or comments, add them here in the comment section or send me. Uh, Barry O'Dell, you can send me a private message and I'll be happy to respond to that. So anyway, have a good day and I will see you on the next video.